Are you guys ready for Mama Tate? Let's give her a way we're all outreach welcome. Let her know you love her and you're ready to receive from God. are so welcoming and you make me feel so comfortable. I love this church. You are so blessed. I'm so grateful to be here this morning. And I was thinking as I was preparing for this word this morning, well, what are my credentials that enable me to be here this morning? First of all, I want to say I want you all to say good morning to my husband, Ivan, who's here. And I know you guys love him so much. I also have my daughter, Abby, here. Would you stand up? She's one of my daughters, my youngest, my baby. My spiritual daughter, Anita, is here. Stand up, Anita with her wonderful husband, John Jew. He's a miracle. He just received a big miracle healing. My daughter-in-law, Ashley, you all know. And my two grandsons were here earlier also, but they have gone for this service. So as I was thinking about what are my qualifications, I started to think about my own where did my motherhood begin? And I got to tell you, it started way too young when I was mothering my twin brother. And I would do his homework and help him to do his chores and cover for him with dad. I just couldn't stand to see him fail. And if you're that kind of a mother, repent. There's nothing good in the future. <laughs> I raised his two sons because he never did grow up and stand on his own two feet. So be the kind of mother that encourages your children to stand up for themselves. I've also raised, thank you, I've also raised four children from babies that I birthed. That's no small feat. Two teens that were my brother's kids many friends, nephews, nieces, and church members' kids, hooligans, vagabonds, you name it, they were in my home. Well, I think we had more than 40 all together through the years that came to live with us. We have an orphanage in Guatemala, and I am mom to hundreds of kids there. We have a feeding program in Kenya, and there's lots of little lovely faces there that I get to go down and love on. And I'm even a mother figure to some adults, as you've met this morning, my spiritual daughter, Anita. I've been thrown up on, pooped on, lied about, rejected, smothered. I've been ignored, I've been kissed, I've been hugged. I'll compare stretch marks with you. <laughs> Birthing stories, nursing stories, C-section stories, no sleep stories, burping stories. With anybody, I've snuggled with babies, pulled my hair out over teenagers, and now I'm living with know-it-all adults. Anybody? <laughs> they got so smart when they turned 21. What happened? I'm like, wait a minute. You used to like look up to me and now you're like, no, 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 no. But I don't mind because I'm a mother. And I'm a woman, a bona fide woman mother, and that makes me a warrior. When I saw all you beautiful mothers stand up this morning, I couldn't help but think of an army, an army of fighters. Yes, we cry. Yes, we get emotional, but it's all for one purpose. It's to fight out of love 
for those that God put in our lives to succeed. And we're not gonna quit. We're not gonna let go. We're gonna believe and believe and believe and believe and believe. So this morning, if I've qualified, if I'm qualified in your eyes to speak on Mother's Day, I invite you to sit back and relax. Take a deep, deep breath. Don't kick your brother. Don't hit your sister. Don't bug any, keep your hands to yourself. And lean in, because we're gonna go to a story in the Bible this morning, to a land far, far away, where there's kings and queens. There's no cars, no airplanes, no cell phones. If you can imagine, no TVs but it's the word of God and a man of God. And we're gonna, so it's very important. And we're gonna learn all about Nehemiah. So let's go to Nehemiah chapter one. In Nehemiah chapter one, it says that Nehemiah, we find the story begins where Nehemiah has heard that the city of Jerusalem is in shambles. The walls are broken down, the gates are on fire, and Nehemiah is grieving. It says he was weeping and he was fasting and he was praying. Jerusalem meant so much to Nehemiah because God was his God and those were God's people, and his dad was from there, and his grandpa was from there, and he was serving in the king's palace, but that's where he came from, and that's where his heart still was, and those were his people, and he was grieving because they were living in such fear. You see, in those days, the cities were surrounded by a wall and they had gates on the cities and nothing could come in and nothing could go out except for through those gates and those gates represented safety and protection they represented the the laws and the commitments that were made that they had agreed on between each other okay we're going to allow this many people in, but we're not going to allow goats in. We're not going to allow cows into our city. They have to stay outside. And so when all the walls were broken down, there were invaders. There were animals. There were thieves that were coming in. And the people were afraid. And it's because of that love for those people that Nehemiah wept and prayed and fasted. And in four and verse five, he ta he's talking to God and he's saying, God, you are great and awesome. That's how he begins his prayer. God, you are so great and awesome. He doesn't start with fear. Oh no, oh no, what's happened? No. He starts in love, in faith. God, you are great and awesome. This is what's happening in Jerusalem. And he goes on to pray and he reminds God of his word. He says, remember when you prophesied, when you told Moses that you were going to draw all your people back together. You were going to bring everybody back to Jerusalem. Well, guess what? Everybody is scattered. Everybody's gone. And that word hasn't come to pass yet that you said would come to pass. And you're great and awesome. I know it's still going to happen. You know, right now, today, I am believing for people in my life to come into the house of God. Are you believing for someone this morning? Are you believing for someone? Has God has given you a promise there's plenty of room in the house of God. There's plenty of room. God has promised that he will bring us back. He will draw us to himself. He will go and seek those that have been scattered, 
those that are lost and among wolves, those that are lost. He's promised to bring them back. And that's what Nehemiah was reminding God about. The walls are broken down, Lord. There's no gates on your city and everybody's scattered, but you're great and awesome. You're great and awesome. Fear is the greatest enemy to love. The word says that perfect love casts out fear. It doesn't make room for it. It doesn't tolerate it. It doesn't understand it. It doesn't talk to it. It doesn't go over and over and over with it and try to convince it. No, don't be afraid. No, don't be. No. The only thing you can do with fear is cast it out with love, knowing that God is bigger, God is greater, God is more powerful than fear. And God's promises are more powerful than the lies and the discouragement that fear bring to us. Fear tries to tear us down. It tries to separate us. It tries to divide us. It tries to tell us we're smarter. We're smarter than God. We're smarter than faith. We're smarter than people that know the word of God. We're smarter. We're in fear. We know more. We got this. If you want to just turn on fear, turn on the news. There's nothing on there about love. There's nothing on there about God is awesome and great. It is a, a huge pipe of fear just, just all over the top of us, a gusher a gusher of fear. But you know, even with a bad report, we can know God is awesome and great. Even when we hear a bad report that we can't possibly know how to fix, we can still stand in a position that says, God, you are awesome and great. And I am a believer in you. I stand as a believer in the midst of this bad report, in the midst of the smell of the smoke of the gates. I stand as a believer knowing my eyes are on Jesus. My eyes are fixed and focused on the man that made the timber that can fix this gate, on the man that created the rocks that will build this wall. On the, on the God, I, I call Jesus a man because he was a man, but he is also God. So ex please forgive me if that's confusing to you. On a God that made the rocks and made the timber and made everything that we can stand firm and know that he is awesome and mighty. So in, when, when Nehemiah went to his king. His king asked him why he was sad. And he said, well, my city, my hometown is in rubble. And the king listened to Nehemiah and had great compassion on him because Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. And what does the cupbearer mean? It means the person that protected the king from all the poison that was trying to kill the king. In those days, uh, people didn't just rush into the throne room and take the king out. They were clever and they would try to get poison to the king. So the king had a cupbearer. This man was very trusted. He was very prestigious. He was very... Um, well regarded in the community. The gossipers didn't go to the cupbearer to tell their gossip. He wouldn't listen to them. He wasn't going to be poisoned himself. That would only, uh, that would only make him vulnerable to passing poison on. He didn't associate with those that would bring up complaints and bring up reasons to overtake the kingdom. He associated with those that believed in the vision, those that supported what, what the king 
was decreeing, those that aligned themselves with the king so that he could be trusted to be the cupbearer. You see, the king had to know this guy's on my side. This guy is for me. This guy is, is loyal. He is committed. I'm gonna, I'm gonna trust that what he gives me, I can drink and enjoy. I can drink and, and freely partake of it. Because Nehemiah wasn't poisoned, he didn't pass on poison. It didn't go through him to others. It didn't pass through him to the king. It stopped right there. He said, no, I know what that is. I'm not partaking of that. I can't afford to. My job says I'm loyal, I'm trustworthy. And so he didn't pass things on. So when he went to the king and said, this is going on in my hometown, the king said, I'm behind you all the way. I'm behind you all the way. I'm gonna give you letters so that when you go to Jerusalem, you're gonna be able to pass through all these provinces on your way and those letters are gonna say, the king is behind me all the way. The king trusts me all the way. In fact, I'm gonna give you a letter and you can go to the, the king's forest and you can use the wood to rebuild the gates, to rebuild the big timbers in the, in the city. And so Nehemiah took these letters, but there were enemies. How many of you know there's always those enemies? They hear about you doing something for the Lord and they're like, excuse me, who exactly do you think you are? The name of these enemies were Sanballat and Tobiah. And on Sanballat, he had a list of everything Nehemiah had done wrong. And so when Nehemiah went to Jerusalem to gather the remnant of God's people together and say, let's arise and build, Sam Ballot pulls out his list and says, excuse me, uh, I don't see any qualifications here. I don't see anything here that says you've ever had any experience with a wall, but I have seen other things. I've seen these failures. I've seen that you can sip wine. I, I see that you can sip uh, milk. I, I see that you can eat a piece of toast and, and that you can protect the king. But w what are your qualifications for building a gate, for leading people? You're always the quiet guy in the back. You're the quiet guy that's just called out at mealtime. How do you think you're going to actually lead a group of people that are in fear and repair the, no. Surely God wouldn't send you. Your history doesn't qualify you. When, God is, when the enemy of your life is saying, who are you to step out? Who are you? You know it's sand ballot. You know when you go to the beach and you spent the day lounging in the sun and laying on the sand and you get back in your car and you start itching? Something is in your swimsuit. You're taking home some of that sand. Well, we're gonna call sand ballot sandy bottoms because it is irritating. It's so irritating. <clears throat> and annoying, and they're tiny little pieces. It's not a stone in your swimsuit, no. It's these tiny little niggling things that get in between your swimsuit and your skin. And for the life of you, you can't get them out. And they get where nothing should go, and they're irritating. And if you leave them there, you get rashes and they, you get the sand burnt. Ugh. It's annoying. Well, Sandy Bottoms was just like that. He had a list of all these little niggling things that could make Nehemiah stop building. If you think I'm talking to you like children, that's because I'm a mother. That's because I preach to children and because you really are children. 
aren't we all really God's children looking for that love, looking for that leadership, looking for that word from our Father that says we're qualified? You can use me. You've forgiven me. You love me. It's okay. I'm not disqualified. You know, Sandy Bottoms is a liar. And when God says, Nehemiah, I want you to go and arise and build, you, you go. You say, okay, God, I'll walk on water. I'll go where you call me to go. I'll do what you call me to do because you are my only qualification. You're the only one I need. That's all I need is you. That's it. My past is separated. Sandy Bottoms can have his list. Let him have his list. Sure, go for it. You can have a list of generations back about me. I don't care because the blood has separated me from anything you can accuse me of. I, I, just look at the blood. I'm sorry. Just look at the blood. Go ahead. Keep reading. But I don't hear you. I'm under the blood. I'm not going to be motivated by fear. I'm not going to be motivated by anxiety, irritation, annoyances, lies. That isn't going to make me. It's not going to break me. Just the word of God. Just his voice in my life. Just the good shepherd. That's who I listen to. The story goes on and all of the remnant in Jerusalem. Nehemiah was an answered prayer for them. You are an answered prayer for someone. Don't let Sandy Bottoms disqualify you. They're waiting for you. They're waiting for you to come and tell them, arise and build, arise and build. And so here comes the remnant. They're like, oh yeah, I want to arise and build. I want to I want to rebuke fear out of my life. I want to build again. I want to live in safety. I want to live in peace. I want to live in unity. That's what I want to build in my life. That's what I want to do. You see, there, nothing good comes from fear. Nothing good comes from being afraid. All come from love. Love is the power. Love is power that casts out fear. That is the motivation for us. And as they began to build, they began to join the wall. Some of the wall they built right in front of their own homes. Some built the wall all the way to the corner. Some built in front of the temple. Some built all the way to Arrowhead. Some built just in front of Hallmark Church. Some built the gates in Tijuana. Some built all the way to uh, Pomona. You realize I'm saying the extensions of this beautiful church. Still others connected to LA. It encircled Arizona, the wall, and was all the way in Kenya because the people were not distracted by fear and all the annoying little things of Sandy Bottom. You see, Nehemiah knew as a leader, he could not be distracted with the accusations and with the uh, demands of Sandy Bottom's group, that whole group. You know, as Nehemiah had the remnant building, Sandy Bottoms group grew also. What? They did. They grew and they had more and more reasons why they needed to stop building. But pretty soon the wall was halfway up. And then it was all the way up. And they were angrier and angrier and angrier. And Sandy Bottoms gathered everybody together and said, what are we going to do to stop this? So they sent a false prophet, since Nehemiah was God's son. They thought, well, we'll get him at his own game. We'll accuse him of building his own kingdom. That's really his motive. His motive really wasn't 
to do God's work. It was really for himself. He wanted to build the city of Nehemiah. But Nehemiah had proven himself in the king's court. He had never passed on poison. He had never been a partaker of the gossip. He had never passed on sand. He'd never taken the sand out of his own annoyance and dribbled it on others. And everybody in his robe pretty much is wiggling because of the sand that just goes from, if you're a sand spreader, you need to empty your swimsuit this morning and we'll vacuum it up after. And you don't have to go home irritated and annoyed. You can go home blessed, forgiven, and with a tool in your hand this morning. You can go home no longer annoyed by what you've heard or what you think. You can go home a builder. You can go home this morning changed because Nehemiah never came down off the ladder. When they sent that false prophet, there were even some in the remnant that listened. But did that discourage Nehemiah? He said, no. Why would I come down off this ladder to answer for that? It's not even in my heart. I'm still building. And then it was exposed that was a false prophet and everybody finished the wall. They hung the gates. Romans 8.15 says, you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. You have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Aren't we just looking for that? Aren't we looking for that? Aren't we looking for that adoption, for that love, for that forgiveness, for that new start, for that building? You know, when they finished the city of Jerusalem and they hung the gates, they looked around and they said, wow, this is huge. We thought it was just gonna be enough for our homes. This is giant. We need to invite everybody that was outside, all those scattered people, all those scattered families in fear. We have plenty of room for you. Come back, come back. And that's exactly what God is building here. It's plenty of room for those people you're believing for. It's plenty of people that have been that are running in fear, that are running in shame and running in, in all kinds of lies, running from what they don't even know is chasing them. There's plenty of room here. And as you stay faithful on your ladder, as you stay faithful to build, can we please have the wall? Thank you. Then you will see it grow larger and larger and, in, and enable more and more people to come in. These are some of the tools that we build our wall with. These are the tools that we use. You know, you don't have to have every tool that I've listed here, and there are so many more that God equips us with. But if you are faithful, you are a builder. You need to be faithful. You are stone in this beautiful work that God is doing. If you are healthy, then God wants to use you to build. You arise and build. You know, you don't have to have everything. Pastor will bring the word and you can just snuggle up right next to him with your gentleness and you can build side by side. You see, everybody that comes and builds adds what God has given you to the wall. You add room to the safety, the peace, and the love. This morning, I know that we don't want fear in our lives. I know we don't want fear because fear involves punishment, the Bible says. It is a in, niggling in the back of our minds that we don't deserve it. 
And because we don't deserve it, there's something in our future that we're going to get what we deserve. That niggling, that lie is separating you from what God wants you to do in building today what God has, the foundation, the wall, the gates of your family, of your own life. Mothers, I know you're believing for your children. I know you're believing for your grandchildren. I know you're believing for your husbands. I know you're believing for so many people. I know your arms are huge, but your ministry is not motivated by fear. Your ministry is motivated with a, with a tool in your hand, the tool of gentleness, the tool of comfort, the tool of honor, the tool of the presence of God, the tool of self-control, the tool of joy. These are the builders in your home. The, you can trust these tools. You can trust them. You can trust joy. You can trust forgiveness. You can trust comfort. It will build your family. It will build your home. It will build your church. Don't let Sandy Bottoms convince you there's another way. There is not another way. You're not going to spoil your family being kind to them. You're not going to spoil your husband by being a comfort. You're not going to... It's not your job to give people what they deserve. It is Jesus that will be the judge and he will give people what they deserve, which is mercy and grace and forgiveness, just like he gave you. And if you really want them to change, if you really see their need, then use his tools. That's how you came to him. His tools, his kindness, his mercy, his love. Build in their lives. Believe. We want to stand as believers, not accusers. We're believers. That's what comes out of our mouth. I believe in this church. I believe in your pastor. I believe in his wife. I believe in their family. I believe that God is doing a mighty work. It's going to spill into their grandchildren. I believe there is, I have not seen, nor has it entered into their hearts, our hearts, what God is going to do with them. I believe in your family. I truly believe in you because I've seen what he's done in my life. I know how far he's taken me. I may stand up here looking like I look this morning, but believe me, there was a lot, a lot, a lot of goings on. Like I said, I'll compare stretch mark stories with you. <laughs> Believing is a battle. We're not here to rest and just say, peace, love, peace, love. No, we're here to say, I'm willing to fight. I'm going to use the right tools, and I'm fighting. I'm building. I'm arising. I'm building. You can count on me. I'm strong. I'm a stone in the house of God. I'm part of the building of what God is doing in the earth today, in this generation. Despite the news, here I am. Here I am. I'm a believer, and here I stand. And this morning, I know that many of you need to know that assurance that God is your father, that God loves you, he accepts you, that adoption. He has not given us a spirit of slavery leading to fear again but uh, we have received a spirit of adoption. And that's what's in the room right now, that beautiful spirit of adoption. And so this morning, if you've been a slave to fear, if you don't know Jesus and that blood that separates you from that nasty sandy bottoms and the accuser, then come forward this morning and let us pray for you. 
Let us pray for you so that you will know what it's like to have a clear mind where you can hear, I love you, son. I love you, daughter. I accept you. I forgive you. You are desired and wanted by God. He is reaching out to you this morning. He is saying, come, let me put you in my family. Let me put you in my will. Let me do for you what I've done for millions of others and give you a brand new beginning. If you'd like to ask Jesus into your heart this morning, please come forward. Please come forward. Thank you. We're gonna to pray together. We're gonna to pray this morning. Thank you so much. Good morning. This beautiful moment can only happen because Jesus is speaking to hearts. That's the only reason. God has prepared this Mother's Day to welcome you. I'm so grateful for you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. These are some brave people. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So right now we're just gonna talk to God because I know that's why you came forward was to talk to God. I want you to say out loud and repeat the words that I'm saying. This prayer I'm going to pray is in the Bible and it, it is um, the prayer of receiving Jesus into your heart so he can change your life. And boy, I see some real commitment. So grateful. Okay, repeat after me, Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you that you've chosen this day in this place to adopt me as your daughter and as your son. I receive you into my heart. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you did it out of love for me. When you were on the cross, you saw me. You knew I needed you. You knew I needed you. I can't do this alone. I can't make up for my sins. I can't get myself to heaven. I need you, Lord Jesus. I surrender. I surrender it all. My heart, my sin, my good intentions, my weaknesses, my doubts, my fears. I cast them at your feet. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to forgive me, Lord Jesus. I know you, your forgiveness is enough. I let go of all my efforts and I receive your forgiveness. Now I receive you as my father. I receive you as my comforter. I ask you, Lord, to change my life from this moment on, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. If you've been battling with fear, I just want to pray this morning that you will surrender to the love of God this morning and be comforted that he is awesome. He is an awesome God. Surrender your fear to God this morning. 
and build, let's arise and build together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this last, this last call she's making is if you're dealing with fear, now's the time to get set free and get delivered. If you need prayer, come up to these altars and our team would love to pray with you. We love you, church. And for those that came up here today, someone's going to pray with you and they're going to get you signed up for your next step. It's called Starting at the Way. Don't forget, you can sign up for um, sorry, Women's Conference. That's this Friday. Women's Conference is this Friday and Saturday. If you have not gotten your tickets, now is the time. And lead night is this upcoming Sunday night. Not tonight, but next week, lead night. So get your tickets for these. You can get it on the app or in our foyer. We love you so much. And don't forget, this Wednesday, we're going to have time for worship and for prayer. It's going to be a powerful night. We're bringing out a violinist. It's going to be beautiful. Don't forget to come out this Wednesday. We love you so much. If you need prayer coming up, we'd love to pray with you. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday, and happy Mother's Day to all the moms. Happy Mother's Day. God bless you.